Hello, hello. It's been a long time, but welcome to another episode of K&K Real Talk. Kenny and I have been super, super busy lately. We have both been on our own adventures, so it's great to have another episode. I have a fellow Ontario in here. Um, Christina, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, for sure. Well, first off, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, This is one of my, I guess, first sort of interviews since my surgery. So um, I'm looking forward to sharing a little bit more about that. Um, But hi, everyone. Um, For anyone who uh, we haven't met before, my name is Christina. I'm another endo warrior, as as, uh, Kristen said, out of Ontario. Um, I also run a platform called Femme Evolve, which was previously a health and wellness magazine, all inspired by, you know, what I went through with endometriosis and wanting to better communicate um, the scientific like background of endo and and what that looks like and and breaking down that information for people that have it. Um, Right now I work a lot um, within consulting, but I am planning on going back to my roots of wellness because this whole surgery, which we'll be speaking about um, just kind of sparked uh, this like feeling of wanting to go back. So I also do a lot of um, public speaking around endo and, and advocating for it as well too. Oh, that's awesome. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about your platform? What exactly is that uh, about? Like, what can you do on it? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So um, Femme Evolve started off as a, a community, basically. So I wanted it to be a, pe- a place, sorry, where people with chronic illnesses, just like endo, um, PCOS, fibroids, any sort of like, you know, health condition that affects like females, women, uh, female identifying individuals could go and talk about these things. And so I would have these events where um, I would bring in, you know, people to speak, uh, they'd share their experiences. And it was really about highlighting a lot of taboo topics. So, you know, talking about sex and intimacy, menstruation, things that we don't normally want to speak about or people don't want to hear about, uh, but it really needs to be spoken about to raise that awareness. So it started off with that. And then the magazine portion, which was a print and digital magazine as well, where on every cover, we would actually highlight a woman who had gone through a really like difficult time in her life and just showcasing how she basically evolved through it. So that's where it started out from. I ran it for I would say we did about nine issues and then I ended up stopping because it just became so time consuming Um, and having endo. um, It just got my endo got worse as I was trying to do that and balance school and work. So I had to take a step back. And um, that's when I ended up going into events consulting because I had been doing that for so long. Um, Of course, COVID hit and I can't really continue with that anymore. So I think the wellness side is kind of calling me back. So I'm, I'm in the process of relaunching that platform now. Oh, that's so cool. I mean, we definitely need more awareness about all of the female illnesses. We don't get enough highlights on women identifying illnesses. So what's your endo story? What, what, so how did you get diagnosed? And then up until what was your most recent surgery that you just had? Yeah, um, I'll try to keep it short since, you know, there's going to be so many pieces to that. (laughs) We all have so many, you know, moving parts to our endo stories. Um, But essentially, my endo started at the age of about eight and a half. So I was really young and didn't even have my period yet. I was just constantly going to the nurse's office at school, complaining of this like stomach pain. And sometimes I would like literally roll around on the floor in pain. And they didn't know what was wrong with me. So, of course, I was going to Sick Kids Hospital here in Toronto. I was going to my doctors. I was in and out, you know, of the doctor's office all the time. Um, It wasn't excruciating to the point that I was in the ER as much as I did when I was older, but it was still pretty bad. And my doctor ended up diagnosing me with a hairline fracture on my hip at the age of 11, which didn't make sense because I never fell down. (laughs) I had no idea where that fracture would have came from, but... I took it at face value and said, you know, he's a doctor. He must know what he's saying. I'm I'm 11. What do I know? Right. So my parents didn't know either. So we just went along with it. I missed three weeks of school in grade five because of that. And then I just started grade six and, you know, hope that things would get better. And then grade seven rolls around. My first period comes and I'm thinking, what sort of hell did I enter? Like, what is this? 
<laughs> this is the worst thing I've ever felt. And I remember my mom and my aunts just being like, oh, this is so exciting. We're so happy for you, your first period. And I'm like, no, 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 this is not what I asked for. <laughs> I thought this was going to be like an easy thing, like a little bit of blood and that's it. But it was, yeah, it was nothing like I, I expected. Um, as I got older, of course, it started getting worse. And every period just became more and more debilitating. By the time I got to university, that's when I would say it was really bad. So that's when I had a ruptured ovarian cyst. Um, it ruptured and I ended up just like throwing up and I didn't know what was wrong, thought it was appendicitis. And the ER doctor, um, the second one that ended up seeing me because the first ones that saw me were like, oh, it's appendicitis, it's Crohn's, it's, you know, a hundred different things. Mm -hmm. Finally, he was like, can you jump? And then when I jumped, he was like, okay, so it's definitely not appendicitis, but based on your scan, it looks like a, a ruptured ovarian cyst. So they told me to go see a gynecologist. And from there, I just went through my very first, uh, my lap. And that's where I got diagnosed in 2014 with endo. So yeah. was, <clears throat> excuse me, was the diagnosis your most recent surgery? Uh, no. So 2014 was um, an ablation surgery, which at the time, I didn't know the difference between excision and ablation, right? I thought, Again, this is a gynecologist. He's an expert. He knows what he's doing. And it was just all hitting me like, maybe the doctors don't know what's going on. Like, maybe I, I don't have to trust everything they say because they, they actually aren't telling me that they don't know about endo. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I had to move from there and say, okay, where can I go next? And, and after he did the surgery, he told me, he was straight up. He was like, I am a gynecologist, but I'm not like a full on endo specialist. So I want you to go see, now that you're diagnosed, you, you had the lab, I want you to go see this other gynecologist who is more specialized. So I was like, okay, I hope this is a better experience. I hope he understands what I'm going through. And I mean, at first it was great. Um, I went through like pelvic floor physio. She helped me um, figure out medicinal marijuana before you know it became legal here in Canada. I was able to go through that process and, and start using that for my pain. Um, I started up something called low level laser therapy, which I actually found on my own through a book. Hmm. Um, and I can definitely share more on that as well. If anyone has questions, but yeah, I've all, never heard of that. Yeah. Yeah. That's what kind of was keeping me at bay all these years. But, um, what ended up happening was in 2016, I told my gynecologist that I was having this really like severe pain on one side, my, my right side. And I said, you know, based on what I've gone through, like hundreds of times, I think it's a cyst because at this point I, I know my body, right. It's been mm -hmm. years since I was you know, 12. And she said, I wouldn't worry about it. You had a scan done a few months ago. I mean, you're fine. I, I wouldn't think too much about it. I was like, I don't know. I, I'm really concerned. She's like, okay, let's just leave it for now. Let's watch and wait. So I decided, okay, it's not a horrible idea to just wait it out and see, you know, if it gets better or worse, whatever. Um, July of 2016 is when I had this really horrible period where I was just bleeding more than I ever did. And I already have really heavy periods, as I'm sure a lot of us do, um, you know, with endo that does happen. And this was just like beyond anything I had seen. So I actually begged my dad to drive me 40 minutes from my house to Mount Sinai Hospital because I live in Mississauga. So he was like, why don't you want to go to the one like down the street? And I said, no, because they're going to make me wait three hours just to be Oh my seen. God, it's so long. Yeah. Whereas Mount Sinai, it's sad to say they kind of got used to seeing me. <laughs> like, <laughs> like so used to it at that point that I would be in and out pretty quickly because they're like, okay, we know what's wrong with you. It's either mm -hmm. a, a UTI or a, a rupture cyst at this point. Um, I wasn't having recurrent UTIs though. So it was just like one off thing. So I go in and they said, good thing you came in because your cyst was the size of a grapefruit oh and God. yeah and they're like you're really skinny already because I just wasn't eating a lot um that sort of fluid being in your body is very toxic um that amount and you're also bleeding internally so you'll need to stay overnight and we'll need to monitor you but the doctor was like you could have died if you didn't come I was oh like oh my God. God imagine if I went to the other hospital and you were just so, waiting waiting and waiting at, which is what so many of us go through right because they just kind of dismiss you thinking that's your period or it's whatever yeah so after that point um they they came back and they said have you ever had any kidney issues and i was like kidney issues no i came here for a cyst like what is this <laughs> what are you talking about and they said well keep an eye on your left side because the cyst was so big it was pushing on your kidney and i'm like what they could get that like i had no idea right this is all new to me um, even though I actually have a background in health and I was researching, um, you know, I was working in like breast cancer and, and neurology, all these things, I would like constantly read journals and all these 
different like publications, but I never heard of one getting that big. Yeah. So I said, okay, I'll keep an eye out, but I hope nothing happens. And I would say just a couple of weeks later, I end up in the, the hospital again, this time with a kidney infection. I take my antibiotics, they go away. And then the next month it happens again. And it keeps happening month after month after month. So I'm thinking, okay, I don't know what that cyst did, but something happened. And I basically got rotated through an internal medicine clinic where I saw so many doctors, a urologist, um, went back to my gynecologist. I was just asking for answers. And it took me about four years to finally find a doctor Yeah, in England who was the one who did my surgery. Um, that oh, wow. was on October 13th of this year. So I flew during COVID to England. Um, and honestly, it was the best decision I ever made because since then, I would say I have almost no pain. Um, wow. Even my periods are significantly better. So I'm, I'm praying it stays like that. But, but yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. So during the surgery, did he drain or remove the cyst? Um, so that cyst was, was gone already. Okay. I think that just kind of moved out of my body. Yeah, yeah. That was about four years ago. But since then, I've been getting them like every three months. Um, I think it's just coming from the amount of stress that I tend to put myself under because I'm the type of person. And I think a lot of us are where we want to do so many things. And then mm-hmm. on our good days, we try to do everything. Yeah. You yes. know? <laughs> so I, I can I totally relate to it. Yeah. It just comes from that like pressure of everything needs to be done today because I'm healthy. And so, yeah, he removed a lot. Um, when I went in, actually, I had an ultrasound done there, an advanced ultrasound where you could actually see the endo. Mm-hmm. I had never heard about that before. I'm, I'm now learning that in Canada, that technology exists, but it's it's very sparse. Like it's hard to come across a doctor that has that. Yeah, I think there. <clears throat> excuse me. I think there's one machine in Ottawa. Yes, and now I'm hearing Hamilton is coming out with it as well. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, which is amazing. But the thing is, I was like basically trying to go to all these specialists within Ontario, within Canada. And they kept telling me based on your case, like we just can't take you because there's some sort of ureter involvement. Um, I got diagnosed with something called a UPJ obstruction, meaning in my ureter, there was literally an obstruction causing my kidney to swell up every month. Yeah. And you could literally see like this, like bulge on like um, around like my ribs and my back. Like it was just really like odd on this, my left side. So um, when I went in for that ultrasound, the doctor who did it, he, he was actually um, specialized in that trained in advanced ultrasound. He was amazing. And he told me, he was like, this is not like just a little bit of ureter like obstruction and mild endo, like you were told, like this is severe. And I was like, what? And he's like, yeah, there's a, like 20 something cysts on my right side. There's like my right ovary was like glued down. Um, my bowel was also starting to be like infiltrated by the endo. And then the pouch of Douglas, which is that little um, space between like the vaginal area and the rectum, that was like covered in endo. Mm-hmm. Um, crazy. I, I had no idea, you know, any of that was happening, but I did know that I was getting progressively worse since my surgery in 2014, right? Like I was tired all the time. I had so much fatigue. I was not even cooking for like the past year, I would say I stopped cooking as much. Um, I relied on my family for a lot of that. Um, and then cleaning was just like, again, on my good days and then I'd overdo it and I'd pass out. So, oh my God. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It, it was so hard. And so I, eventually I, I went to see the, um, the specialist. His name is Dr. Barton Smith. He's amazing. If anyone has the opportunity or lives close to England and can see him, he's amazing. And um, he looked at my scans and, and he said, you know, the reason you've been having all this bladder pain because I would like cry out every time I was going to the bathroom to pee. He said, it's because your bladder nerve is literally covered with layers and layers of tissue. And I was like, what? So there's no obstruction. And he was like, no, there's no obstruction. If if someone took the time to actually just investigate and listen to you, they might've found that. I said, wow. But again, in Canada, sometimes they're just not as, as diligent about it. So I underwent the surgery. He asked me if I wanted my diaphragm checked out as well, because mm-hmm. I had complaining of shortness of breath. Again, thinking that it was the kidney swelling up every period that was causing it. But I later realized it wasn't. It was, it was now um, after the surgery, I found out there was endo on my diaphragm um, and now in my lungs as well. So it was just like going into it with one sort of expectation and coming out learning like, oh, it was nothing like what I expected. Yeah, it's almost like we should each get a a full body scan picture (laughs) just so we can know 
what's going on in there. So did they have to like remove any of your ureter or did they like, they just scrape some out, scrape it? Yeah. So the the ureter ended up being fine, which I was shocked by. I did something called a mag three scan, which I'm sure some of you probably heard of um, anyone who's listening, uh, which essentially checks your kidney function. Mm -hmm. And all this time they kept telling me, it's so weird that your kidney function is okay, but you have all these like horrible infections. I did one MAG3 scan in Canada that showed that my left side was functioning at like 40%, which oh my God. I thought was really low. But then when I went to do it in England, they said it was fine. So mm-hmm. they told me your ureters are, are actually great. They, there's no damage. Um, there's nothing wrong with your kidneys. It's just that there's so much endo that it's triggering an infection every month. It's just so widespread. It's like, you know, all the organs are just like stuck together. So yeah, um, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I had that too with all the organs stuck together. It's, it's horrible. Yeah. Um, I was getting a lot of cysts too. And so they put mesh over my ovary. Is that something that they did with you too? Oh, wow. no, no, they didn't. Um, for me, it's just managing my lifestyle as much as I can. Mm-hmm. Um, and I plan on trying these castor oil packs. I'm not sure if you've, if you've heard of them. Like, Yeah, I have. I'm yeah. curious about that as well. I used to use them and then I stopped again. It just became time consuming. I feel like with endo, we have so many things to already worry about. <laughs> I was like, I have to take the, these supplements and I have to do this thing and this thing and it was just an extra layer but um, now that I'm healing I'm, I'm decided like I do want to give it a go because there's evidence that it can help um, with cysts and just kind of keeping them at bay and, and, and shrinking them as well. Awesome so um, I'm a medical marijuana user as well and I'm always happy to find other ones. I know that a lot of women who listen to the podcast and follow me are either not fans of medical marijuana or they're moving over getting interested in it I do get a lot of messages um, with questions about strains and stuff like that Um, so what's what's your recommendation in that area what do you like do you like to smoke do you have a certain strain that you find that's helpful do you use CBD oils yeah um, so when I started out I I was open to kind of like whatever form was available because it just got to a point where I was actually very reliant on, you know, opioid medication. Like I'm exactly very open in saying that I was taking like Oxy, um, Mm -hmm. Tylenol three with codeine, everything, right. That, you know, a lot of us go through Mm -hmm. and I just became so reliant on it, but there was a host of like digestive issues and, um, headaches. And I don't know if I can keep taking this long term. Like, what does that look like for me? So I decided I just wanted to ditch all of that and go down the natural route. So of course, my diet started changing. Um, exercise became really important to me. And for pain, um, I only take naproxen now, which is like maybe two pills a month, two to three pills a month. On top of that, though, I, I feel like I do really like the medicinal marijuana because it helps with my appetite, which is completely shot when I'm in pain. Mm-hmm. Um, it's so hard to go through that. And when I had the kidney like issues as well, I would have this horrible back pain, which they would just yeah. tell me to take morphine. And I'm like, I don't think I want morphine. I, I think my, <laughs> my, my just running off. through your kidneys. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so, um, I started off with edibles. Actually, I didn't do too well with them. I just found like, I couldn't figure out what dose was right for me, like how much to take or, it's so hard. I would just end up like <laughs> completely losing it and feeling like I was going crazy. Um, so I, I found that using a vape is actually really great for me because it's a little bit easier on the lungs. Um, I can kind of control how much I'm taking in. I'm really open to kind of trying different strains, but I find like an indica is always good or a hybrid for me. Um, sativa, I will go for, for like the appetite stimulant, you know, like mm-hmm. the THC really helps with that, but indica is great just to like help my body, like calm down. Um, and then the hybrid's good for like during the day. It was really funny. Actually, my gynecologist, we were talking about it when I first got diagnosed and, and I told her that I got the vape from the company that I, I went to. And she was like, that's great. Like, just go outside of your classes during university, like take a puff and go back in. I was like, honestly, that's what I need to do because I, I literally can't focus sometimes. Um, and yeah. it sounds weird to focus more on that, but uh, just not being in pain helps. It, it helps to, to focus. Yeah, I, I don't think people get that. Like I do take a lot 
during the day. And I don't think people understand like how to be functional, but when you're in pain every day and you're tired and you have all these other symptoms, it's not like another normal person taking a puff where they're maybe like super yeah. high. It kind of just makes me feel like normal again. Exactly. It, it's not so recreational. It's almost like I need to do this to feel okay right now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I I used to look at it as like, when I started, I was like, oh, maybe this isn't the best thing. I don't don't know if I should be taking this because of course there was so much stigma around it when it wasn't legalized here in Canada. But as I got better, I started saying, this is kind of like my medicine in a way. That's how I have to reprogram myself to look at it. This is like another form of medication. It's just, for me, it's a plant-based, it's a more natural form. Right. So I think changing how you look at it helps too. Yeah, I totally agree. I started off with my medical license through a chronic pain clinic. And um, like he he was all about it because I was taking a lot of opiates. And I am I'm so glad that I switched. It's it's literally like night and day. I feel like the op- opiates make me mean. <laughs> and and medical yeah. marijuana just makes me more happy. <laughs> which uh, adds to my happiness already. So it's, I I think that people still see it as like a drug and like, or like a street drug where it's like demonized, which I myself was the same way. I felt like it was horrible and it was like the, one of the, the worst things you could do. And once I researched and actually looked into it and the history and it's, 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 it's gotten this weird stigma that it didn't deserve in the first place. I agree. Yeah, definitely. I I think that there needs to be a little bit more talk about that. It's great that that we're discussing that because I I rarely hear that um, on podcasts or other things, people talking about, you know, how it can actually help with endo. So I think it's important to keep talking about that. Yeah, I agree. I like to talk about things that other people don't talk about. We have podcasts about sex and other taboo things, but that's what we need to hear. We need to hear other people going through the same things that we're going through so that we don't feel so alone and that we don't feel like we're like crazy or like weird. No, we're all, we're all human. It's okay. It's okay. (laughs) So true. So true. All right. Well, we'll we'll wrap up. Is there anything else that you wanted to say to anyone? Any tips, any tricks, any advice? Yeah, um, I think just when it comes to advocating, when, you know, when I got diagnosed, there was, like I was saying, I, I just blindly trusted my doctors to have all the answers and be able to help me. And I think, you know, if you really do need a second, third, fourth, fifth, whatever that opinion is, <laughs> go for it because um, now that I've gone through all these doctors, I can finally say I'm starting to feel better than I probably have since I was, I don't even know, maybe seven years old. Like yeah. it's been long of being in pain. Right. So um, it's just like feeling like a, a whole different way about life. Um, secondly is have a great support system. So surrounding yourself with friends that do understand, because I know it's easy to lose friends over this um, to have people that make you feel isolated. So just finding that, right support system, friends, parents, partner, whatever that might look like, siblings for you. Um, And then, yeah, just, you know, don't be afraid to do the research on your own and really look into things. I know that, again, like I was studying this and I was still kind of like, where are all the answers? What am I doing? But I I think once you just take the time to ask questions, um, talk to other people who have been through it, listen to podcasts and resources like this, um, you can definitely be closer to, to finding the care that's right for you. So it's just a bit of trial and error until you finally get there. Yeah, find the people, the doctor, and the medicine that is right for you. Find a doctor you're comfortable with, and you don't feel like they're just giving you the answer that they give to everyone. No, everyone should be treated case to case basis. Everyone is different. Even though we all have endo, our cases are very different. Find friends and family that you're comfortable with. We have the Facebook groups that you can join that have tons of other endo warriors and just find people that are good and make you feel good because when you feel crappy you don't want to feel more crappy exactly exactly surrounding yourself with like good positive resources always helps 
Yes. Yeah. Happiness. <laughs> positivity. <laughs> We're already in a very negative world. Our bodies are treating us like crap sometimes. Exactly. Okay, well, thank you for joining another episode. I hope to have another episode for you guys soon. Thank you so much for watching. See you next time. Bye.